Hello everybody, it's Mr. Robbins back again to continue our discussion of period six. So last time we talked about the urban uh, America that was coming into being during the Gilded Age. Uh, we talked about growth generally, kind of reasons why that growth was happening, uh, and then talked about one particular part of that population growth, which would be the uh, influx of new immigrants from places in southern and central and um, eastern Europe. Now we're going to stay in the cities and continue to talk at least in part about those same people, uh, but now we're going to kind of widen the scope and talk a little bit more about um, attempts to reform urban society and then really get into a little bit about what what made this urban society unique as far as culture goes. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into it. So, urban reformers. Now, as we talked about last time, there were many people that saw um, both fear and opportunity with the new immigrants. Uh, but, as we saw with the nativist response, it was very negative. The response of political machines and politicians in these big cities was more beneficial to the native uh, to these immigrants, but not because they needed help, but because those politicians needed votes. But there are going to be a small but very dedicated group of reformers in these big cities, really trying to help the new immigrants, but along with them, the other poor and disadvantaged folks living in these areas. The first I want to talk about is Jacob Reese. Now, um, Jacob Rees uh, is a journalist and photographer, and he is going to investigate the situation of tenement living amongst uh, immigrants, okay? We talked a little bit about these tenements last time, okay? But imagine these, you know, very, very cramped apartments, you know, Multiple people, you know, six, seven, eight people living in a cramped room, maybe half the size of my classroom, um, uh, just densely packed uh, buildings close to each other uh, that were, you know, these are all made of wood, high fire risk, high rates of disease, uh, poor utilities, uh, very little access to things like indoor plumbing and so on and so forth. And this is what Reese is going to focus on. Here's just a little stat, and this is something that I, all, I heard here, but also heard when I visited the Tenement Museum in New York City. Really awesome place to go if you ever go to New York City. Um, but at this point, kind of the late 19th century, the Lower East Side of Manhattan in New York City was the most densely populated place in the world, and it wasn't even close, uh, around 334 thousand people living in a single square mile in New York City full of these tenements okay now this is where Reese would go uh, as he was beginning to investigate uh, the problems faced uh, by uh, those in poverty many of them the new immigrants uh, now he he presented this in a few different ways the first thing he did as a photographer is he took pictures um, and then he made basically as a primitive slideshow, kind of like what I have up here, but not a PowerPoint. It was like actually like on like pieces of glass and had like a projector and stuff. Uh, very high tech for the time. Uh, but he would give lectures and, and speak uh, uh, to groups of middle class New Yorkers and show them some of the pictures that he took, and they would be just shocked. Um, gasping, if not in just kind of just silence, uh, just based on this. Um, and then eventually he took kind of what he talked about and put it together with a lot of these images and published a book called How the Other Half Lives. Um, you would see this, this story of like, you know, people crammed into these tenements. Um, this is a crazy set. 60 or more people sharing one toilet in a single water tap, that's, you're not sharing that, right? You, people are doing their business outside of there because they can't do it. I mean, you know, family of four, I know probably some of y'all are like, I, I could barely share a bathroom with my brother or my sister, much less, you know, 59 other people. But that was the situation that these folks were dealing with in the tenements. 
So here are some examples of some of the images that he took. Uh, up in the top uh, left, you have uh, children. Children oftentimes unsupervised. These are not children that are primarily going to schools. Uh, so they are just roughing it out on the streets, hanging out. Um, I mean, people will leave children, like infants, in the room, their rooms just hanging out so they can go work. Uh, that's kind of how it was at the time, looking at how close these buildings are and, like, I mean, how ramshackle they look. I mean, these are, you know, not much more than kind of shacks almost, these tenement buildings. And this is probably one of the most iconic images that Reese took. Uh, inside one of these tenement apartments, okay? Now, this is an apartment, right? He's taking it from the door. Apparently, with a lot of these images, like, he didn't tell people that he was doing it. Uh, so he would just, like, take pictures and it flash, and then, like, he goes away and, like, people would chase him and stuff. Uh, but this is an example, like, you know, open room, a door they saw. There are no windows in this room. There's a stove to keep them warm where they do their cooking, and that's everything. But, I mean, I see... One, two, three, four, five, six guys at least, if not more in here that you can't really tell where they are in this one little room. Like, just imagine living like that. I think most of us today can't. Now, the point of all this was Reese is trying to spur reform. He doesn't just want to shock people and just be like, whoa, check it out, you know? Like, he wants them to say, Let's do something about this, all right? And it actually worked. Uh, it started a public outcry over things like uh, indoor plumbing and sewers. Uh, to be quite frank, it's not all just to help these people, but it was well known by this time that kind of, you know, the open sewers that exist in these tenements, like they cause disease that spread widely throughout the rest of the city and to other parts of the city. So focusing on kind of health by having sewers, indoor plumbing, kind of more access uh, to indoor plumbing in these tenements. Um, eventually what happened is that a lot of these slums, they can't actually be repaired to be brought up to code. So they get torn down, new parts get uh, built, and then larger, more accommodating uh, apartment buildings that aren't quite tenements are built for poor folks in areas like the Lower East Side of New York City. Next, I'm going to switch and talk about the city of Chicago and talk about Jane Addams, right? Now, Jane Addams has very much the same kind of impulses that Reese does, uh, wanting to help the poor and disadvantaged in her hometown of Chicago. Uh, she's kind of a middle-class person. She has access to some money and uh, uses that to rent a former mansion, hold house, in a poor immigrant neighborhood in Chicago and start to open it up for services for uh, poor folks and immigrants in Chicago. So some of the examples of the services she provided, day nurseries to watch kids while their parents were at work, uh, primarily their mothers, adult education classes that are going to teach immigrants uh, how to learn English if they came from a non-English speaking country. And eventually, this the group, the whole house, it grows and grows and grows um, into providing more services, uh, practical sources, uh, courses on cooking, dressmaking, personal hygiene. Uh, eventually, it would expand to a dozen buildings, serve 2,000 people a week. Now, Jane Addams kind of makes a model here with Whole House and like the, the who she's focusing on providing services for, the services she's providing that other reformers from other big cities see and they say, hey, we're going to make this thing in our city. And this is what becomes the settlement house movement. Now here you see uh, Whole House, that is Whole House up there in the top left. Uh, where all this started. Down in the bottom right, you see an example of one of these nurseries in a whole house watching small kids, infants, little kids, uh, while their mothers are working, right? Um, now, as this model spreads, there will be about 400 settlement houses across America. Um, and we eventually see that the settlement houses are going to move into lobbying and actually pushing for local governments to enact re reform legislation to deal with the problems that can't really be fixed just by the settlement houses themselves. Now, one important bit about the settlement houses is who is working at them. We're primarily talking about middle-class women. 
A lot of these women, uh, they maybe have gone to college, but due to the standards at the time, there aren't a lot of professional opportunities for women. But the settlement houses open up some new opportunities because, I mean, it's a highly, highly important job. It's, you know, you got to be very organizational. I mean, they have budgets. They have all these things. And so women are able to kind of take on those more professional roles and get organizational and leadership skills that they probably would not be able to get otherwise because they would be shut out of other professional careers. Uh, and this starts to create amongst this more middle class group of women kind of capacity for organizational leadership skills that will be used even more as we move into the 20th century. Next is Walter Rausch and Bush in the social gospel movement, and this we're going back to New York City. Now, Rausch and Bush, he was a theologian, he was a Baptist preacher, uh, and he, his parish was in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood of New York City. Now, back in this time, Hell's Kitchen was a very, very dicey place. It was an area of high, high poverty, uh, crime, and amongst uh, other things today, it's a very different neighborhood. It still has the nickname. Um, now, Roush and Bush, as a preacher, of course, is influenced by his Christian beliefs. But he has kind of a new twist on, on Christianity, what we call the social gospel, that is kind of new and kind of combines Christianity with this new impulse to help the poor and the needy. The basic idea that Roush and Bush would espouse is that um, Christian principles of love and justice, right, were very much needed in urban areas, okay, and that it's not just about getting you as an individual into heaven, right, his parishioners, but it's about transforming life on earth into the harmony of heaven, and so that meant helping the people around them and kind of living in the model of Jesus Christ by, by helping the poor and the sick and the needy, okay? Now, this does form itself into this so-called social gospel, right? And it very much took on this, this responsibility that churches, they had not only kind of a need, but a moral responsibility to take the lead in these social problems and helping the poor, because isn't that what a good Christian would do as they would conceive of it? But to us, I mean, we're like, okay, yeah, I mean, churches do, you know, community service all the time. That's pretty normal. That was not the norm at the time, and so this is a, a new thing for sure, okay? Now let's talk a little bit about popular culture. Now, when we're talking about leisure, popular culture, we definitely need to make a point that um, there really wasn't like that for most of American history, or most of, like, human history, um, being able to just, like, sit around and, like, just, like, enjoy yourself and your time, um, for most people, um, yeah, that, that's not the case. Um, but that is starting to change, right? Because really, we're starting to get a, a new group of... Americans that are rising in number. And it's small at this time, but it's going to get bigger and bigger. Uh, it's going to be what we would call the middle class. And this is something I've actually used before, this term middle class. But to be honest, there's there wasn't much of the middle class that you and I would imagine it uh, today uh, that existed before this time. Okay, Now, let's talk a little bit about who's making up this middle class. Uh, we're talking about m corporate managers, so they're not the owners, right? They're not the uh, Rockefeller and Carnegies. They're not mega wealthy, but they are involved in the day-to-day -day operation and management of corporations like Carnegie Steel or Standard Oil, and that has given them a pretty high amount of income while also probably doing mostly work that's, you know, sitting at a desk, looking at things, typing things up, things like that, right? And then you also have urban professionals, right? So think doctors and lawyers, uh, accountants, others that are going to be part of kind of these growing businesses that are also going to be making probably more money and have a pretty 
uh, easy, non-physical, more a mental job to do during their work day. Now, their levels of income are going to push them into a situation where they meet all their basic needs. Right? They, they have food, they have clothing, they have rent, they even have savings at some point, right? Um, and so that allows them to not work all the time. So they might have their weekends off. They might even be able to take a vacation for a week, which is something that was basically unheard of for um, anyone that was not a super wealthy person before that, Right? Now, we also see that there are new activities in the big city, so there's, there's ways to use that free time. Uh, in a uh, ballad from eight, the 1890s, a mother from the country warns her daughter to be wary of the temptations, quote, in the city's giddy world of amusement, right? Okay? Nah, we ain't listening to that, mama. Get out of my business. We gotta go to the big city, okay? Because we got all this fun stuff, right? We've got nice department stores. We have sports to go to. We have newspapers to read. Yeah. Let's start with department stores, okay? Now, um, we see that the first department stores open up in these major cities. R.H. Uh, Macy... Uh, which is the kind of uh, ancestor of Macy's today, same same company, uh, in New York City, uh, Wanamaker in uh, Philadelphia, uh, Marshall Field in Chicago, opened these huge, huge stores, right? Now, they were bigger than any store that existed at the time, okay? And they had many different types of items, that would be divided, right? So there would be a clothing section, a men's and a women's clothing section, and then maybe there's a section for um, furniture or another for appliances, different departments, right? This was the department store, okay? Now, this was a very different uh, shopping experience, right? It's intended to be a place where you could go and, in theory, get many of the things that you may need as consumer goods. Uh, and you would come in, clerks would be dressed well, they're there to provide you service with a smile, help you out as you look around at clothes and other ready-made uh, products from our factories. Um, and then inside them, uh, there were areas to lounge, rooftop restaurants, tea rooms, right? And they also had elevators, so you didn't have to go up the stairs, okay? Another leisure activity would be spectator sports, okay? Now, this is really the first time that there is anything like spectator sports um, in the United States uh, in our history. Of course, ancient times had spectator sports, think back to the Colosseum in Rome. But this is really where kind of sports as part of popular culture really comes into vogue. Now, shouldn't be too surprised that the one that comes into vogue first is America's pastime, baseball, right? Now, some folks today, especially in the South down here, the state's football, but you know, the original America's pastime was baseball. Uh, the first salaried baseball team, meaning that they're actually getting paid to play baseball, was the Cincinnati Red Stockings, the kind of ancestor of today's Cincinnati Reds, which would be formed in 1869. Um, they would then later join part of the National League, uh, which had competitors, most notably the American League. Eventually, these two leagues would merge together into uh, an organization called Major League Baseball, MLB, setting up the system of baseball as it is today. By the year 1889, two million fans would cheer uh, their local teams at major uh, league games across the country in big cities. Now, football is a pretty big one, too, and it's probably going to be the second most popular uh, sport. But it is not professional football, and in fact, we're not going to see professional football arise well into the 20th century. Football of this time, it's college football. But in SEC football, not all just yet, the first places to get football, to organized football teams, would be at Ivy League schools like uh, Princeton, okay, also Rutgers, another example 
uh, Princeton Rutgers in the first intercollegiate game in 1869. Uh, very, very quickly, and by the turn of the 20th century, college football is kind of part of the collegiate experience, something that is just even more so true today. Now, newspapers. Okay. Now, newspapers also take up some of this leisure time. Um, and now you're thinking, newspapers, that sounds boring. Okay. Well, you know, if newspapers are boring today, you probably wouldn't want to see the newspapers before the Gilded Age. Now, newspapers have a long history in America. We could go back and talk about newspapers during the colonial period and during the founding of the early republic. Um, but for most of this early history, what we would imagine is a newspaper... Uh, it's actually not going to be many different pages. It's, it's on a few pages uh, because they don't want to spend too much money on paper and ink. Uh, but it would be so incredibly packed in with like small print with tons of stories, mostly about local news and events and like politics and like bo boring, st boring, I'm bored already, Mr. I'm bored by you talking about it, Mr. Robbins. Yep. Well, that would change with uh, the uh, uh, actions of a guy named Joseph Pulitzer. Now, if that name sounds familiar, you may be thinking about the Pulitzer Prize, uh, which is not uh, given to journalists and writers once a year now, named after Joseph Pulitzer. Now, he got into the newspaper business with the idea that this had to change. The tombstones of just walls of text had to be changed to make them more appealing to readers to make more money by selling more copies. Okay, Now, he would buy the New York World, which was one of these tombstone papers before, um, and modernize it, make it look a lot more like a newspaper you and I would imagine, right? With large headlines, with just kind of a blip of the story to kind of draw your eyes in. Comic strips to be something to look at for entertainment. Sensational stories, tabloid type stuff about celebrities, about natural disasters, about corrupt politicians. Think guys like Boss Tweed, right? Um, to draw readers in, okay? Now, when you add in a few new uh, inventions, some that we talked about, typewriters, which makes it a lot quicker to write up these stories and get them printed. Telephones, which allow much quicker for news to travel, and so you can, what, what they used to do back in the day is that if a reporter was on assignment, like, they would write down their story, and then call in and, like, read the story off, and, like, someone on the other hand would, would type it all up for the newspaper. They did that a lot. High-capacity rotary presses to make thousands and thousands and thousands of copies of newspapers a day made it, uh, the New York World and Pulitzer uh, very, very popular, and Pulitzer are very, very wealthy. Here are some examples of what the New York world would look like, right? So you see the, the, the top one, um, a huge uh, cartoon drawing, okay, because not all, it's not all photography yet, but a huge cartoon drawing, uh, Balthazar Blaine and the Money King. So this is about um, James Blaine and uh, uh, some political corruption going on, right? So, oh, I'm trying to figure out who all's in here. Whoa, that's crazy, right? There's another one. Nellie Bly, a famous journalist of the era. People were like, who does this lady look like? Okay, hey, we're going to we're, hey, we're publish our photograph. Yep, we're going to publish it. Yeah, but by the, new, by the newspaper. Or, hey, this is actually the headline of like, hey, it's going to be published later, so be prepared. It's coming out on Sunday. This is from Friday. Now, newspapers are also going to operate differently, not just on how they look, but who is actually paying for all this stuff. Now, before the world, newspapers, they paid for themselves by you paying for the newspaper, right? Like, you were paying like a fraction of the cost it took to have all those writers write and have all the printers print all those newspapers. But... The New York world had a different model, advertisements. Now, they would charge pennies for the newspapers, like five cents. I mean, they're cheap. They're, they're very accessible. But when you open it up, there would be many, many ads for different businesses. Department stores are probably the best example, probably the most committed uh, newspaper ad buyers uh, to promote sales for that week or that month, right? Now, by 1900, 
Uh, we see American businesses spend about $500 million on ads, which would be 10 times more than they spent in 1870. That shows you kind of how more and more newspapers are going to start adopting this model that the New York world first sets up. Now, let's talk about one other cultural thing and talk about art and literature in the Gilded Age, influenced by the reality of the urban environment. Now, the last time we talked about art, we talked about a new emerging movement of romanticism. Okay, Romanticism was tapping into your feelings, kind of going out into nature and seeing the splendor of nature and having it influence you and all these things. Well, it was hot and fresh for like the early uh, 19th century, but by the late 19th century, that seems uh, passe and like boring and old, okay? Mostly because of these twin forces, industrialization and urbanization, which are very rapidly changing societies here in the United States and across the world. Okay? And it's going to make some of those social realities, things like we talked about the tenements and the poor treatment of those in poverty and so on, that really kind of make it where you're like, I can't talk about optimism and feelings and stuff. Like, just look at these things that are going on. Okay? Now, we see that this is the formation of the realist, right? Or realism where these uh, American artists and authors are going to reject that and say, listen, no, we want to show what life is really like, and we want to show particularly what this urban environment is like, okay? And so they focus on parts of the modern world that they could actually experience, like things that have actually happened and are happening around them, right? Because those idealized landscapes and love stories, it just it doesn't fit where we seem to be going, Okay. Now, as far as art goes, one of the best schools or most known schools of realism would be the Ashcan artists, okay? Now, these Ashcan artists, guys like George Bellows, uh, they would begin to depict things that they saw around them. This is uh, particularly centered in New York City. So they would paint things like working class taverns with guys, you know, coming off work all dirty and stuff and carousing and drinking, prize fights between boxers, the tenements, alleys and stuff. Like all these things are just like, like very raw and real. And the critics of the time who had, you know, only really seen romantic art, they're going to see this and say, this stuff is garbage. It deserves to be put in an ash can, which was a garbage can for hot ashes, literally. Okay? And so instead of saying, oh, they think we're garbage, they say, oh, oh, they think we're garbage? Oh, yeah, we're, we're the ash can. We're the ash can, guys. Yeah, we're garbage. Ha-ha. Uh -huh. Right? Now, this is probably one of the best examples of this ash can school of art by Bellows here, called the Cliff Dwellers, right? But the cliffs they're dwelling in, they're not in, you know, some Pueblo... Uh, area in the uh, American West, right? You know, it's not like a cliff. It They're buildings, right? Those are the cliffs. And you see here the bustling of of a town. You see people stand, uh, sitting on the corner side. You see people up in their uh, apartments hanging clothes to dry over the street. This is, you know, it's not a photograph, but it is a very real kind of raw experience of like actual lived experience in a big city like New York, um, which to some is just too uncouth to actually do. Now, authors also are going to reject romanticism and focus on kind of a realistic portrayal of, of what life is really like. Uh, two examples uh, would be uh, authors Stephen Crane and uh, uh, author Theodore Dreiser. Now, Crane... Uh, probably one of his best-known books is this book, uh, Maggie, Girl of the Streets, where she, he talks about this young girl who moves to the city and the harsh conditions, the harsh situation she's put into to make ends meet. And it's very raw and it's very, like, you know, shocking almost, especially to more uh, feet middle-class Americans. But it, again, it reflects reality as opposed to some sort of romantic ideal that we've dreamed up for ourselves, which definitely goes to show us, hey, you know, things must be changing rapidly 
for people to to want to see this, uh, want to write this, but also for people to see this and buy these books and say this this reflects my lived experience as well. Okay, so that also shows us how much America's culture is changing due to this urban environment. Now that's where we'll leave it uh, for now. Next time we will get into finishing up the Gilded Age by going into a deeper dive into Gilded Age politics and populism. We gave a little taste of this with the emergence of the political machines and how they use uh, new immigrants to their benefit to get votes. But we're going to dig down a little bit more into politics next time. We're going to talk a little bit about why, really, in this unit, you haven't heard me talk a lot about like presidents or politicians. There's a good reason for that. But then we're also going to talk about how at the end of the Gilded Age, there will be an outcry really asking to fix a lot of these problems that we've been talking about, and some that we haven't mentioned yet, that we will call populism. But we'll save that for another time. See you then. Bye.